All right, so I think the way that the problem of complexity has been solved, and this is the best argument I know of for the truth of the Darwinian notion of evolution. Now, I don't think that our models of evolution are complete by any stretch of the imagination. I, I know they're not, partly because of recent work done in epigenetics, which suggests that you can, you can inherit acquired traits. Right? And when I went to university, when I started going to university in the 1980s, that was heresy, really. Like, no, you cannot inherit acquired traits, but actually you can inherit acquired traits. That's the field of epigenetics studies that. And that, that's a radical shift in perspective, because we also don't know exactly what that means across any length of time. And when you're thinking about evolutionary lengths of time, you're thinking about three and a half billion years, because that's the span of time over which life evolved. And so even things that don't have a overwhelmingly marked potency for one generation can be unbelievably powerful across time. And then there's also the issue of sexual, sexual selection, because you know, you'll hear Darwinists continually describe the world and the evolutionary world as a place of randomness. And that's not true, it, and I don't know why they make that statement. The mutations are random, or quasi-random, because we don't understand mutations that well yet either. And most mutations are deadly, right? Most mutations are deadly, there's a set of them that are harmful but not deadly, and then there's a tiny, tiny proportion that could, in principle, produce some benefit to the next generation, assuming environmental, environmental shift, say, in the direction of the mutation. So, and that's, there's a randomness element to that. We know that, I mean, part of the reason that you mutate, or your cells mutate, your DNA mutates, is because of background levels of radioactivity. And a lot of that's a consequence of solar activity, right? So cosmic rays come zipping through the atmosphere and they nail your DNA and produce minor alterations and that's a mutation. And if you crank up the background radiation rate, like say around Chernobyl, then the mutation rate rises. And there's definitely a random element to that. And it's necessary for there to be a random element because as far as I can tell, the only way you can beat a random environment is by producing random changes. Right? So, you know the idea, basically, that the, the environment isn't some static place that's selecting for higher and higher levels of fitness, or not in any, not in any, it's certainly not doing that in any static way. And so it's shifting around randomly. And then, you know, you have a structure that's been, your species has a structure that's a consequence of this immense evolutionary journey, and it's moderating itself randomly within certain parameters. The parameters being that most mutations will kill you, like alterations in your fundamental form generally tend to kill you, so they're incremental. And so the mutations are random and they match, hopefully they match the randomness in the environmental shift, and so you can more or less keep up that way. But then there's additional complicating factors, and they're not trivial, and one of them is whatever epigenetics does, we don't know anything about that yet, but the second one is sexual selection. And sexual selection is no joke, it could be the primary thing, it's certainly one of the primary things that's driven human evolution, and I think you can say that you think about the environment again, well, let's think about the environment so, you have a dominance hierarchy, and that's really an old structure the dominance hierarchy is 300 million years old, because it emerged pretty much whenever there was whenever there was a nervous system, emergent nervous system, and whenever animals had to occupy the same territory, they automatically organized themselves into something approximating a dominance hierarchy. So it's a very, 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 very old structure. It's older than trees. It's older than flowers. It's old. And as far as real goes from a Darwinian sense, permanent is real. And so when you, you can say, well, you know, our arboreal ancestors adapted themselves to trees, and so the tree was along, lo, around long enough to be a feature of the environment. But the dominance hierarchy has been around a lot longer than trees. And you can think of the dominance hierarchy both as an adaptation to the environment, because you'd kind of think about the dominance hierarchy as a cultural construct. But if a cultural construct lasts long enough, then it becomes part of the environment. And so the dominance hierarchy is part of the environment. And what seems to happen, roughly speaking, and this is an oversimplification, but we'll go with it, is that males have a dominance hierarchy, and there's a relatively small number of males that are relatively successful, and those successful males have preferential access 
to female reproductive capacity either because the females actively choose the the more dominant males, which is very, very common or because the more dominant males chase all the less dominant males away so that even if the females don't exercise choice, which they often do then the only males left around that can serve as reasonable mating partners are the more powerful ones and so you think you've got two really radical determiners of evolution as a consequence of that one is that each I'm not talking about female dominance hierarchies at the moment but I can talk about them, but that's why this is an oversimplification but what happens is that the males obviously are selected for their ability to move up dominance hierarchies obviously, because the ones that are at the top of the dominance hierarchy reproduce preferentially and so that means the male dominance hierarchy becomes a method of selection but then allied with that is the female proclivity for choice on whatever dimension the dominance hierarchy happens to be arranged and so then female sexual selection also becomes a radical um, non-random selector of, of, of what, what genetic material is going to move into the next generation and so I, I fail to see how any of that can be separated from the emergence of complex nervous systems and mind over the course of evolution because people aren't, creatures aren't making random choices they're not random at all so we even know such things like imagine a peacock's tail you know and it's covered with eyes, which is quite interesting because eyes, of course, attract attention. And lots of animals have evolved eye like markings. Like moths, there's moths that when they unfold their wings, they have two big eyes on the back of them. And that's to keep birds from eating them, right? Because the birds don't like being stared at. So they stay away from the moths. But so a peacock's tail is nothing but eyes. And so it's very attractive and it shimmers. And there's something about it that's beautiful, which is quite interesting too. The females have obviously been selecting the male pe peacocks for beauty. They have this insane tail. Well, so the evolutionary biologists have thought, well, what possible utility could that tail be? Is it just maybe the females got fixated on tail, so to speak, and you know, you got a Baldwin effect loop going there, and the male peacocks just got bigger and bigger tails, and it's just like an evolutionary dead end. It's you know, it's a positive feedback list system that's gone out of control. But they have done things that like look at the symmetry and 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 breadth, say, or the symmetry and size an overall quality of the male peacock's tail as a marker for physical health so reduced parasite load for example and it does turn out that the healthier male peacocks have better tail display and so the way, what the females seem to be doing is using some marker or some set of markers as a proxy indicator for 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 health and i think i think you could say with with reasonable you could say reasonable that reasonably that female human beings do the same thing to male human beings and there's some of that vice versa too like we evaluate each other for example for symmetry which is one of the elements of beauty because healthier people tend to be more symmetrical and lots of animals use symmetry butterflies if butterflies won't mate with another butterfly if it deviates from symmetry by the tiniest amounts you can imagine so symmetry is a marker and there's other markers like shoulder width to waist width is one and waist width to hip width is another that's usually what Males use that to evaluate females in part. So there's lots of markers of health. Um, but it also looks to me like the, the, the data worldwide seems to indicate that women, so imagine that women mate across dominance hierarchies and up, socioeconomically speaking. And on average, across cultures, women go for men who are about four to five years older. You know, it varies. In the Scandinavian countries, that's shrunk a little bit, but not that much and in other cultures it's bigger I would say that depends to some degree on difficulty of establishing economic independence right because in richer countries it's easier to have enough economic independence if you're a male to be to be a useful participant in the process of having children um, but it doesn't matter cross-culturally it's still across and up where men mate across and down they don't care much about socioeconomic status it doesn't seem to be part of their selection method um, generally speaking so, so, I think that part of that is also that the ability of women to select for, for male health, it's something like that, because it isn't only that, because if you're healthy and energetic, you're much more likely to be successful, because it's very hard to be successful if you're ill, obviously, I mean, so, because the competition is just too high, 
And both, both genders, both sexes select each other for attractiveness, both select for intelligence, both select for personality, although the, the, the different, there are differences there in terms of what's, what's stressed. But, so, so, so I think you can derive a couple of things out of, out of this, and this is where I think people are different than, than other animals, importantly different, is that, so you imagine that there's tremendous selection pressure to uh, towards the production, let's say, of men who are good at climbing male dominance hierarchies or, or climbing the male dominance hierarchy. But the thing that's so interesting about people is that we've multiplied our dominance hierarchies. You know, if, if you take an animal that's got a rather static behavioral pattern, then there's, there's a single hierarchy. Elephant seals are a good example of that. So elephant seals, the males are absolutely massive. They're way, way bigger than the females. And they basically have harems, roughly speaking. And they, they use physical prowess as their marker of status, essentially. And obviously size is a huge part of that because otherwise the male elephant seals wouldn't be as, they're massive, these things are absolutely enormous. And so it's just power slash health, you know, maybe aggression, something like that. It's whatever makes them more um, suitable for the kind of physical combat that elephant seals engage in. So, and the degree to which power is associated with dominance status in those sorts of situations seems to be associated with the size differential between males and females. So the more power is an issue with regards to male competence, the larger the males are compared to the females, and the more likely the males are going to have a harem relationship with the females. And you see that a little bit in human beings, because men are bigger than women. They're not overwhelmingly bigger, that's sexual dimorphism. And you know, there's some men that are smaller than some women, but on average men are taller and they have more upper body strength and so forth. So there is a power element to male competition, but it's not as extended as it would be among animals, say like, like elephant seals. So in the elephant seal, you see maybe there's one stable set of traits that's being selected for that makes the males more likely to reproduce. But human beings, we're very weird creatures because we're so conceptually flexible, and so what seems to have happened, maybe we started, males started selecting each other for do, in dominance competitions for something like cognitive flexibility and, and conscientiousness, it's something like that. So that would be the ability to abstractly represent the world and then the ability to operate effectively within it, to represent yourself socially in a way and then to carry through with that, because that enables people to trust you. So it's something like that. and so. That produced cortical expansion, and then women were selecting men who were good at that, and that produced cortical expansion. And then there's an arms race between women and men with regards to intelligence, so the women kept up, or they certainly kept up with, with, with intelligence as, as the evolutionary cycle continued. But one of the consequences of selection for cortical expansion and increased cognitive flexibility was that the number of dominance hierarchies that human beings could produce started to multiply, right? Because there's all sorts of ways that you can be successful. There's, you think about how many ways you can be successful in a modern culture, and, and you can be successful in dimensions that aren't really even associated with each other. So you can be successful socially, that, that's what an extrovert would do. You could be successful in terms of intimate relationships, that's what a, an agreeable person would do. A disagreeable person would be more successful with regards to competition. A person who's high in neuroticism would be, would be trying to protect themselves and to establish some sort of security. An open person would be looking for a flexible, creative environment. And so there's this multiplicity of, of ways that you can establish a dominance hierarchy and be successful in it. And if you're creative, you can come up with your own damn dominance hierarchy. Which is exactly what you're doing if you're creative, right? You, you spin up a game that's your game. And then you, you make the rules. And that's hard, because if you make a new game with new rules, it's hard to monetize it. But you can be the best at playing that game, and so that's a huge advantage to being creative if, if you can pull it off. So then you think, well, what's happened among human beings is the multiplication of the set of possible dominance hierarchies, so it's become very broad, and then you could say, well, what's, what's driving selection now is the ability to be successful across multiple sets of dominance hierarchies. And that accounts, at least in part, for our cognitive flexibility. And so that's really what a human being is. A human being is a creature that has high potential for succeeding across a very wide range of potential human dominance hierarchies. And so that gives us our transformative psyche. That's the niche that, that's the niche that we've 
both produced and occupy. And I think it's out of that that hero mythology emerges fundamentally. Because I think what the hero is, the mythological hero, is a representation of that part of the psyche that's particularly good at being successful across sets of dominance hierarchies. And it's a very, very biological way of thinking about it. And I, I, I've thought about this for a long time. I, I can't see any way that that just can't be the case. I mean, how else, how else could it work? If we had a fixed behavioral pattern, like beavers, you know, you're the most successful beaver if you build the best dam, it's like, fine, then you know what's going to be selected for. But that isn't what people are like, and it's also why we're so multi-purpose, you know. We have hands. What, what's a hand for? What's the evolutionary function of a hand? Well, you, you can't specify that. You could say, it's something like, well, a hand is useful for doing a whole bunch of different things with. Well, and mouth, tongue, same thing. What are words for? Well, it's the same thing. They're for, very, they're for communicating a very wide range of information. It's something like that. So we're, we're these weird general purpose animals, you know. We're not great at any one thing. But we can swim better than most terrestrial animals. You know, we can run faster than most animals. And we can certainly run longer, like a human being can run a horse to death over the course of a week if, if they're in good shape. So, like, we're really good at being a multi-purpose entity, like a rat, you know, where they call rats weedy species because they can be anywhere. They don't have a specific niche, like, you know, there's animals down in, in uh, the Amazon that they're specialized for like one tree, you know, or one type of tree in one tiny little area. That's not what human beings like, because we're, we're like cockroaches or rats, which is a nasty comparison, but we can go anywhere and thrive. And so, and so being particularly good at that, being particularly good at being able to go anywhere and thrive, also seems to me to be a canonical element of the hero mythology. So.